Warzone is another episode that is more fun to analyze than it is to watch. The episode introduces us to Charles Gunn and company, who we spend most of the story with, and, as with any plot that tries to get us to care about a completely new set of characters rather than the ones we've already formed a deep emotional bond with, the results are somewhat on the meh side. As charismatic as J. August Richards is, and he is, Gunn and company are tropes we've seen a hundred times before, and what might have been a solid emotional payoff gets undercut by some dodgy dentals. But on closer examination, I think there might be something very interesting going on with this episode's structure, and with Gunn himself. We open on a young woman walking a dark alleyway at night, followed by a pack of silver chair vampires. The lead grunge rock pyre turns, and for a moment we think it's Angel, what with the dark clothing and the first few notes of his theme. But instead we meet... Charles Gunn. The woman is Gunn's sister, and the two of them lead a gang who defend the streets from the Midnight Nasties. The vamps in the alley get the best of Gunn's crew, who all dub the Lost Boys, and the gang returns to Neverland to attend to their wounded. On the other end of the spectrum, Angel and company are attending a party of billionaire David Nabbit, who is having some unfortunate blackmail issues having gone to a demon brothel. Angel tracks the blackmailer from the brothel to an alleyway. The Lost Boys see him coming and save the blackmailer from Angel. Angel accidentally flees into Neverland and saves Gunn's sister from a booby trap. Enough of a gesture that Gunn lets him go. The vampires from the opening scenes are having a meeting about the Lost Boys and decide to attack. They take Gunn's sister in what is a genuinely harrowing scene. The shots of Alana being murdered through the ugly van window and Charles' expression after really bring the consequences of this life home. It lands in a disturbing fashion. Angel returns to Neverland to try and offer his services. Unless, of course, death is what you're after, then you're on your own. I'm always on my own. Angel gets locked up, Gunn kills his vampire sister, a pretty good emotional beat is interrupted by some enormous lisp-inducing vampire teeth. Oh, say goodbye to everything you ever knew. I thought they'd figured out the lispy vampire dialogue problem after Darla died with marbles in her mouth. There was a time when we shared everything, wasn't there, Angelus? Apparently not. And the episode ends with Angel and Gunn striking a pact of mutual support. Warzone is a strange episode. The only writing credit went to Gary Campbell, his lone Buffyverse script, whose other resume entries include The Kids in the Hall, The Jamie Kennedy Experiment, and Mad TV. With those sorts of entries, is it odd that Warzone feels so dry? It's another very transitional episode away from the episodic film noir vampire detective concept the show started with. Season 1 has been nothing but an experiment as the writers tried to find their voice, but clearly they were leaning towards a more serial style show going into season two, which by necessity would have meant building out the cast. Thematically, David Nabbit is set up in stark contrast to Gunn's world. The opening cuts back and forth between them are intended as direct commentary. I like to smell a little money once in a while. Pick me up like I was a baby. It's dust, Bobby. Forget about him. Guns is a violent and transitory world, one with no expectation of long life. It's also much more ethnically diverse. Nabbit is isolated by money and class. The episode is mostly the introduction of Charles Gunn, and there are a few structurally interesting elements to it. Throughout, the Rube Goldbergian style of his gang and their improvised stick, cannons, and traps kept making me think of Peter Pan and the Lost Boys. Like Peter's Lost Boys, Gunn's gang of misfits have no expectation of ever growing older, and they too have a Wendy, who is eventually captured by the pirates, before returning to London to eventually grow old and die. Though Angel's speech at the end, Who the hell are you? Name's Angelus. inadvertently relegates Gunn to the role of Rufio rather than Pan. I'm always on my own. Whatever racial commentary the episode is making through the pan analog gets especially interesting when you consider that in the original 1953 version of Peter Pan, the Lost Boys were all white, and some of the movie's portrayals of ethnicity have, uh... Why does he ask you how? 
Not aged particularly well. The vampire gang may also have been designed to be racially evocative. Their leader is white with a shaved head, and their daylight gas mask outfits feel vaguely reminiscent of the Nazi SS. The problem is, the episode doesn't really have anything new to say about ethnicity and economic stratification in the United States, but rather uses those ideas as the backdrop for the introduction of these two characters. And like Hero's goose stepping racial purity demons, these themes are so top shelf that without any kind of pay off to their use, I found them a distraction from the emotional story that was going on. Nabbit is the less interesting of the two, though his presence does give Cordy a nice moment where she comes to realize how far she's progressed from the beginning of the season. Nabbit represents for Cordelia a simple and straightforward return to the life she thought she was going to have before she left Sunnydale. Though it might have involved a bit of moral compromise to do so, Nabbit is a good-hearted man, and without a doubt, Cordy could have run the show with him. I like David. It's such a strong, masculine name. It just feels good in your mouth. <laughs> Can you imagine episode one, Cordy, turning down the opportunity to gold dig the kind, safe, and inoffensive Nabbit? David and Gunn's presences both feel like waters being tested. Gunn's character offered an outsider's perspective to Angel's world, in contrast to Wesley and Cordelia, devoid of privilege or pretense. Of course, that's all part of the well-known trope his character is from. The impoverished African-American male from an inner city who has resorted to a life outside the law to find some kind of justice, and has no expectations for a long life. We're dying here, Gun. Everybody dies. But it's a value to distinguish between a trope, a cliché, and a stereotype. Tropes are simply patterns that are familiar to us in media, frequently used plots, characters, or devices that we recognize. What matters is what the story does with them. For instance, Cordelia began Buffy as the bog-standard mean girl trope. God! What is your childhood trauma? Four years later, she might be one of the most complex characters in the Buffyverse. I think for that reason, in order to consider Gunn and his arc in the series, it's important not to simply dismiss his early appearances as tone-deaf or cliché. Appreciating an arc means taking both ends of it into account, but that also means we're going to have to talk about things that never make anyone uncomfortable, things that Gunn unambiguously mentions in this episode. I don't need advice from some middle-class white dude that's dead. Race and class. For being so progressive in regards to issues of gender and sexuality, neither Buffy nor Angel's shows have had much to say on the topic of race, save for Mr. Trick's observation early on. Sunnydale, admittedly, is not a haven for the brothers, you know, strictly the Caucasian persuasion here in the Dale. It's a cute and self-aware observation by the writers that is quickly swept aside and maybe a little overshadowed by his witheringly cringy final line. I hear once you've tasted a Slayer, you never want to go back. But in short, to this point, any non-white actor has been relegated to a minor supporting role, and many of those suffer a quick death. Representation across media is important for many reasons, not simply for the sake of reflecting the world we live in. In their essay, The Individual, The Institutional, and The Unintentional, cited in the description, Mary Eotropolis and Lowry Woodall suggest that studies show popular culture's centralization of whiteness effectively limits the scope of perception of what exists and what's possible, not just on screen, but in the viewer's mind as well. In other words, a portrayal of a same-sex relationship as healthy and normal in a show also normalizes those kinds of relationships for people who consume that media, and a lack of diversity across media normalizes whiteness and pushes other ethnicities to the status of well, other. And that phenomena is actually an aspect of Gunn's arc that we'll get into. This will be an unfolding conversation, but I want to say a few things here as framing. First of all, the trope that Gunn's characters cut from feels stale because of its overuse in media, but that also doesn't make it irrelevant. Second, while I'm going to be looking for what's interesting about his arc, because that's kind of what we do here, that is not to say it's never mishandled or free of stereotypes and cliches. Just as some of Buffy's feminism feels dated today, there is plenty to cringe at. But as someone who was the sweet spot age when Friends was airing and laughed while completely oblivious to the potential harm of Chandler's transphobia, I'll just point out that the root of the word progressivism is progress, and progress is by definition measured over time. Also, I know we're a very international audience, and issues of race and class vary from country to country. Our 
discussion will specifically be focused on those issues as they pertain to the states and inform Gunn's character. Finally, in case you hadn't realized at this point, I am not a sociologist nor an academic. I do a lot of reading and research with these essays, but mistakes will come. To this point, I have had the grand privilege of not having to wade into these conversations, but they are an aspect of Gunn's journey, and it's a commitment of mine with the guides to do every character justice. But as much as there may have been a few missed opportunities here, Warzone is an adequate and entertaining episode. J. August Richards feels like a fun and charismatic addition to the cast, and it's nice to see that our core has already developed to a point where they can reflect and feel differences within themselves. Still, the wonderful 5x5 gave us a demonstration of what a complex and intricate antagonist could do for the show. wonder if there's a direction they could go in with that. <laughs> Somebody else?